Good morning, G Free. Well, I get to do a slightly different uh, act this morning, so to speak. Uh, before I get started, I, I had the I was blessed this week. We talked briefly about the Leones who are here in the country. I got to spend about five or six hours with them trapped in a car. I was transporting them somewhere and got to learn about their ministries, but they're going to talk a lot. I think they're talking. Are they speaking in church? I think so, yeah. Uh, so I don't want to give any secrets away. But these guys, what they do, not just in their missions work, but they had just finished flying 20 hours with three children from South America, or South Africa, because they were at a conference there for Christian surfers, uh, international conference, and then they were coming here to spend a full month going church to church of everybody who supports them with their three children in tow. These people, every year they do something along these lines. They go visit. So one year they do PA, I found all this out. One year they do Michigan. One year they do California. For the few of us, I know I saw Chris in here and the Myers in here. So it's one of those small world things too within the church. I found out that Kyle Leone was one of Doug's, we called him Smiley McGee when we did our, uh, our missions trip back in 28, 2016, 2015, we, uh, we did missions work uh, here at the church. I think 30 some of us went down to Florida. But it, basically, we called him, I don't know his last name, that's awful, but we called him McSmiley Face because this man was just happy to be serving all the time. He was always smiling. Do you remember him, Sean? You were a little tight at the time. Okay. But Doug, okay, McSmiley Face as we called him, was actually Kyle Leone's youth leader from California, and that's who actually got her into ministry and ended up doing that. So it's a, a, a crazy world, and they'll talk about their chicken ministry and surfing ministry and all this great stuff that they're doing down there. So our support is really important, and I feel very blessed to have gotten to do that. So unlike what Jonah talked about being nervous a few weeks ago, I'm a little nervous, mostly because I have a plan I told some folks this morning, my nerves are fine as long as I come up here and get to wing it, because I, I can't screw up winging it, right? I'm just kind of going. But I've got a plan this morning, so I'm going to do my very best to make sure to stick to the plan and not talk too fast. So, starting over again. So, good morning, G Free. Today, I want to talk about a central idea to our Christian walk of faith. Am I good? There we go. Grace. God's grace, or rather, amazing grace. So why do we say it's amazing grace? Well, the concept of grace certainly is a, a big part of our uh, theological walk here in Christianity, but it's really, it's an experience. It's a gift. It's something that's around us each and every day. So today we're going to talk about five different kinds of grace that God provides for us. The first is common grace. Common grace refers to the grace that God provides all of mankind all around us every day, regardless of whether they're believers, faithful, or non-believers. This is things like the wilderness, the great weather outside, when you get to go on a cruise and look at the ocean, things like that. We're going to talk about sustaining grace. This is the grace that supports us and strengthens us whenever we're in times of trials or weakness or we have trouble in our life and we're reaching out for that greater power to help us out and help us through the problems. We're going to talk about serving grace. It's a little different twist and, and it was interesting studying this. This is what our talents and abilities and what equips us to do what God's work is in our lives. And we're supposed to be using those talents and gifts and abilities for his purpose, whatever that purpose may be in our life to grow. Saving grace, whoops, I'm getting all excited here and hit the button too much. Saving grace is the grace we normally talk about here within our walk as a Christian, right? This is whenever we, uh, the grace that leads us to salvation, it's the unmerited or undeserved favor from God that brings us to faith in Jesus Christ. And then finally, we'll be talking about sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is that continuous action of the Holy Spirit in every believer's life as we work to become more and more like Jesus over the course of our lives. So, here's the fun. It's story time with Bob. Now, 
I get to tell a story. Uh, it's a long story, so bear with me. Uh, but it's a, obviously you're going to be shocked about this. It's about amazing grace. Uh, but uh, I'm going to walk through and see if you can point out the different types of those five different types of grace that we're referring to today. So when I was eight, I became a believer. I was saved. My salvation moment was at eight years old in a church service my grandmother drug me along to at our local church, and I accepted Jesus into my heart. Now, I was saved, yes, and clearly had started some relationship with Jesus, but I really didn't have a close personal relationship with Jesus. If, if this was Facebook, it'd probably be the relationship status would be it's complicated, okay? So my, my young life growing up, I, I uh, had some struggles there. So what I'm about to tell you, it's a story about kind of a deeper transformation that had begun in me with my relationship with Jesus, but it wasn't all the way there. We're getting there, right? So, okay, so when I was 16-ish, I think I was 16, I'm pretty sure I was 16, I was a rebellious, I know you're not gonna be shocked by this, I'm a teenage boy, but I was a rebellious, sometimes angry, always, always foolish, 16-year-old kid, and I was kind of living dull lives. So I would go out on the weekend, I did drugs, I drank, I swore like a, like a, any trip, sailor, I was, well, you're a sailor, I didn't want to offend you. Uh, <laughs> swore, swore like a sailor, uh, uh, did all sorts of stuff I really shouldn't be doing, but every Sunday I was faithfully at church, I went to youth group, I did all the things I was supposed to do, and I served in different areas within my community. One of those ways I served was playing trumpet, and um, I played taps at like military funerals, that was good money. I played for weddings, even better money, um, and, you know, I obviously at school and those kind of things, and at special events throughout the, the area as well, and I was pretty darn good not to toot my own horn. <laughs> yeah, this is where I get to have the joke that, you know, these are the jokes, folks, yeah, okay. Um, you got that one, I didn't have to push, good. So, I was asked to pray at, uh, at that point, a United Methodist Men's uh, group had a breakfast every year at a camp. So they asked me to drive out at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning in the middle of the woods. It was out S.B. Elliott, Parker Dam State Park, that area. And I wasn't real happy about it, probably because I would have been out the night before doing things I shouldn't have been doing. But I was a teenage boy, and they said free breakfast. So I'm like, all right, I can get out there to eat, right? So I rolled into the camp about 6.50, right before their day started, and the food smelled so good. They had sausage and bacon and pancakes and... It was eggs. I was really hungry and because it was also 6.50 in the morning and on Saturdays you don't do that as a kid. So I was ready to eat. Uh, some things never really changed there. But <laughs> they said, they come up to me and they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray and then you're going to play. How about like a song like, you ready? Amazing Grace. I know you're going to be shocked where that came from. Um, and then everybody would eat. And I said, okay. So they prayed and I played Amazing Grace, of course, quite wonderfully. I said I was full of myself at the time. <laughs> then the leaders came over to me, and they shook my hand, said, that was great. Thanks. You can go now. I was quite upset, still hungry. I said, no food, no money, just literally come out, a wink and a handshake, goodbye. I got up early. I drove all the way out there. I used my wonderful skills to help them. I grumbled and I complained and I said all sorts of nasty things to myself. You know, you kind of walk them back to the car and I'm like taking my trumpet and my stupid music and my stupid stand and go to the stupid car and drive to the stupid breakfast. And I just grumble, grumble. I was not a happy person. So I'm standing in my car. I open the trunk and I start putting the stuff in the trunk. And uh, this old rickety pickup truck pulls up beside me, right up, right beside me. You know, you're gravel roads. I'm in a state park, so I'm on a gravel road. Pulls up beside me, and you know, it's, you know, one of these trucks, like the, and the fenders are all mismatched and stuff's falling off. And this really big, probably my size now, really big gentleman with this great big kind of unkept beard pulled up beside me, and he yells at me, Was somebody out here playing a horn? Well, as I noted, I wasn't in the best mood at the moment because I didn't get to eat. So I was sure he's about to complain about the noise or something. You know, we're out in the middle of the woods. 
And I yelled back, equally grumpy, yes, but I'm done now and I'm leaving. At which point, this guy began to weep in his car. And I'm not talking just teary-eyed. I'm talking that whole body unable to kind of stop yourself blubbering as he sits there. And he proceeds to tell me the, the, the story, his story. A few months ago, his wife wanted separation and threw him out of the house, so he moved into his camp down the road. Then over the course of those few months, because of where he lived, he kept getting late to work, so he got laid off from his job. Earlier in that week, his wife had filed for divorce and said she wanted the house, the kids, and the dog. He was really upset about the dog, too. <laughs> he said he had lost everything, his family, his house, his dog, his car, his job, and now he was afraid he had lost his sanity. He proceeds to tell me the most important part of this story, which is he wasn't a Christian, but his mom always told him that she was laying her laying her troubles at the foot of the cross. She kept saying that when he grew up. So over the last couple days after he had, his wife had filed for divorce, he thought, well, I'll give it a whirl. He wasn't a believer. He built a cross out behind his cabin. He built himself a little rock altar that he could kneel at. And he decided he would try this talking to God thing because he had never done it before. And he didn't really know if he believed or not. He didn't know if God was out there or not. So at 7 a.m. in the middle of the woods, by himself in the wilderness. He tried praying for the first time in his life and his mother's favorite song, Amazing Grace, starts echoing in the woods as he's praying at the cross. He thought he had lost it. He was done. So he went looking, he got in his truck and started looking for some answers. Um, and here a disgruntled, hungry teen was. I found a friend of mine who was also a youth leader because let's face it, I was a 16-year-old kid and this was an older adult I really shouldn't be hanging out with in the middle of the woods. So I went and got my friend, his name is Fred. Fred and I went and we followed this man back to his cabin and the cross that he built in the woods. And we spoke to him about Jesus and what it meant, what salvation meant. And we talked to him about what it would mean for his life. And that day he found Jesus in the middle of the forest because a disgruntled, sinful teenager happened to begrudgingly be playing a song in the middle of the woods. My friend also had a Bible with him, and he gave it to him, and he spoke to the man about church, and he talked to him about what would be next in his life and how to uh, take the salvation and move forward with it. So obviously this story is filled with all sorts of different types of grace that we are given throughout our lives. Some we ask for, some we don't. So again, common grace, this goodness and kindness from God that regardless of our belief in him, he is going to give us, right? Matthew 5, 45 says, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The beauty of creation around us, or in this case, the wilderness or even the music I was playing, the provision of food or lack thereof for me, <clears throat> And the enjoyment of life's beautiful things are all types of this common grace that are wrapped around us all the time. This is where things like saying grace before a meal comes from. It's simply thanking for the provisions that God has given us. Um, and most of the time, even the non-believers at the table will bow their head and say, let's eat. Recognizing common grace helps us appreciate what God's love for all of creation is all about. And it challenges each of us to reflect on his grace in our daily lives and the people we happen to run into in our daily lives as we move forward. Sustaining grace, I like to also call this the atheist and foxholes grace, right? Uh, this is the grace that supports and strengthens us in times of trials and weaknesses. It's God's power that enables us to endure and persevere when we want to give up on things. 2 Corinthians says it this way, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I won't boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. The story of Job in the Bible tells us how sustaining grace carried him through his immense suffering and loss, his family, his belongings, every, his friends, everything. And as Job's faith in God remained steadfast, despite his trials. Like I felt 
completely and totally unappreciated and being used and asked to use my talents without rewards like breakfast, God still was able to find a way to use me for his good. Or like this man I met in the wood, the woods that had lost everything, his family, his home, his, his, his job, and he felt completely broken, and God found a way to work in him. Trusting this sustaining grace means relying on God's strength in our weakness, relying on God's strength in our difficulties instead of trying to rely on our strength during times of difficulties. It reminds us that his grace is always sufficient for every challenge we face, rather large or small. Serving grace, this is, as we talked about earlier, this is the grace that equips and empowers us for service in the kingdom of God. It gives us gifts and abilities and talents. God gives us these gifts and abilities and talents to fulfill his purpose while we're here on earth. Though we get to choose, that's part of the free will, we get to choose whether to use those gifts and talents for his glory or whether we try to do it for our glory. Or we do as the scripture uh, story says, you know, hide it, uh, bury the talents, right? So we don't use them because we're afraid to step out. Um, First Peter says, each of you should use whatever gift, whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. The early church, this is coming from Acts 2, is the greatest testament to the serving grace. They devoted themselves, I'm just going to read it quick. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe as the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anybody who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes together. They ate together. They were with glad and sincere sincere hearts. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily to those who were being saved. See, the believers, they shared everything in common. And they served one another with glad and sincere hearts. That's the part that I was failing on earlier in my story. Much like the men in my story were gathering to break bread together, or pancakes and sausages in this case, or me using my trumpet to to serve the Lord even if I was not happy about it in the moment, or my friend who provided, was provided by God, but he had the knowledge and the wisdom, and in this case even a Bible handy, to be able to serve that man in the wilderness. Serving grace, serving grace encourages us to identify what our spiritual gifts are to build up the church and serve our community. It calls us to be active participants. We've talked a lot about that in church recently. It's about being an active participant in God's work because he's equipped us to do good deeds. This is a reminder that we're part of a larger community, whether that community is your family, Machine and Valley, G Free, Church Big C, it doesn't matter because we are all given some of this serving grace in different ways to be used for his purposes in his way and in his time. Saving grace. Um, This is the grace that's leading us to salvation. This is the core grace and belief of us being a Christian, being saved through Jesus Christ. Referring to the undeserved, unwarranted, unfavored gift of God that he provides that love and brings salvation to all humanity. Ephesians 2 says, For it is grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's, it's not what we do here, folks. And Titus then reminds us, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. This is a gift that is readily available for everyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many bad things you've done. It doesn't matter if you're a new believer or if you've been going to church your whole life. Salvation is here as a gift for everyone. The story of the prodigal son in the Bible is is one that many of us know quite well. And it illustrates the saving grace well, right? Despite the son bailing on his family, saying, give me all my inheritance now. And he goes out and he lives a horrible, sinful life, foolish life throws all his money away, but the father still welcomes him back with open arms and actually throws a party because he's so excited about it. 
This symbolizes God's willingness to accept us and forgive us as long as we come back to him. The man in my story was so desperate for God's love that he literally was crying out in the wilderness, hoping something, someone would respond. And indeed, God did. God provided using a broken, sinful me with some talents that he had given me, some graces he had given me, to be able to serve him and let that man be able to find Jesus that day. Embracing our saving grace means accepting this free gift of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But we need to understand what that means. Saving grace, it means recognizing we don't deserve it. It is unearned and it's undeserved. It is a gift from God, reflecting his love and mercy for all of humankind. We cannot achieve salvation through our efforts or works or even being super holy and righteous all the time. We can't do it. We can never be good enough or holy enough to earn it. It means believing that we are redeemed and we actually are cleansed and forgiven for the sins that we have committed. Through saving grace, we are freed, we are forgiven, and we are restored. This is all made possible through Christ's sacrificial death and then resurrection. He paid the penalty for our sins and opened a way for a reunion with God. It means being transformed into a new life for us. Saving grace not only forgives, but it transforms us into something else, a new person, a new being. Believers are reborn. That's why we say that in the Bible over and over again. This is a new person, a new creation, becoming new in Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians kind of says it well. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. The new life involves a process. It's all part of being Methodist, free Methodist. We, we have a process here. This, method, this process involves sanctification. And that's where the Holy Spirit works in us as believers. Once we become believers, it works in us to be more like Christ over time. Which we'll close out with sanctifying grace. This is the continuous ongoing action and process of the Holy Spirit working in our lives every day, helping us grow to be more holy and conform to be more like the image of Jesus Christ, to be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday, to wake up every single day and choose God, choose Jesus, choose to try and be holy. Philippians 1.6 says, Be confident of this, those who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul's transformation along the road is a really good example of this. Uh, he went from persecuting and killing Christians to being one of the primary figures in the New Testament. That is a powerful example of sanctifying grace. The man in my story was experiencing saving grace. He was right at the very beginning. While I, as a very young believer, was experiencing this, experiencing this sanctifying grace. I was saved, but I really didn't have that relationship that I needed yet, and that was moving me along. It was molding and challenging me to form that closer relationship. And even my friend, my, my youth leader buddy, you know, uh, he was kind of an introverted fellow, so this was not in his wheelhouse, I know that. And this was something that moved him further along to say it's okay to reach out and do this. Sanctifying grace calls us to a daily walk with God, seeking his guidance and allowing his spirit to mold us. It encourages us to pursue spiritual disciplines like prayer, reading our Bible, serving, fellowship, evangelism. This really was a form of grace that I didn't understand. I didn't, couldn't wrap my head, head around because I initially kind of, we're saved, ta-da, but we need to continue to move forward. We're saved by accepting the gift of salvation, that's true, but we're not done. It's a rebirth movement. We become a new create, creation. But soon as we do, we're now infants in the kingdom. We're just at the beginning of that journey. 
So we're going to grow into ch children and then adolescents and disgruntled ones at that, adults, and eventually we become elders in the church that are more mature with a much deeper relationship. This is what the concept of what's known as entire sanctification in the holiness movement, which free Methodists are part of, uh, uh, believes in. So kind of a great way we talk about this in CMA, uh, uh, Christian Motorcycle Association, a lot. So a great way that I like to look at this is God loves you just the way you are at any point in time, but he also loves you so much, he's not going to leave you there. He's going to bring you along. So as we see, grace abounds in many, many different ways, in many, many different kind of definitions. Just to kind of rehash then, everything we see and touch and eat is that common grace that's out there for us. It, it, this is where that comes into play. There's the no atheist in foxholes. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. The everyone, uh, whether you're a believer or not a believer uh, alike. The sustaining grace is the no atheist in foxholes. See, that's where I have a plan and it messes me up. Uh, uh, which is when we reach out when our lives hit a bottom spot and we just need that s sustaining grace. We call out to him. Serving grace are all those gifts and abilities that we're given here on, in this world to be able to serve others and use it for his purpose, hopefully. Upon receiving the gift of salvation through saving grace, we're bonded to Christ for eternity. And we are redeemed through him. All of this grace kind of gets us to this point, but we're still not done because we're still just a baby Christian. And we need to grow in him, which leads us to sanctifying grace. Once we're saved, we are continuously to seek him every day and be more like Jesus ourselves. It's about personal holy growth in the kingdom. So my question is, what, is, what amazing graces uh, have been bestowed upon you guys in your lifetime? What grace might you need right now, today, that you're seeking are you here because you've seen the wonders in the world? Or maybe you're just lost and broken and you're looking for something to sustain you and lift you up at the moment. Are you here because you now believe and you want to take the next step and accept Christ into your heart? Well, seek somebody out. Seek Pastor Noel. Seek myself. Seek the worship team leaders. Talk to one of the ministry leaders here in the church and we will help you take that next step. Are you here because you are saved, but you still kind of feel empty or hollow or lost? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm there right now. I, I know that God has called me to do something. I know that God has told me to step forward and give my life to ministry but I don't know what he wants. I feel like I'm screaming in the wilderness and sometimes I just don't feel like anybody's listening because I'm sure not hearing anything back. That doesn't mean I'm not a believer. That just means I'm at the next stop along the journey. I'm waiting for those answers and I'm just here to say, what now, Lord? And that's okay. That's part of that growth process. It's all a journey and the Lord, he is here with us. So if we call out to him, we just need to follow when he responds. So thank you, folks. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are here before you with hearts of gratitude and praise for your boundless grace. You've showered us in love, and we are in awe of your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we've received salvation and the promise of eternal life. Your grace brings us from darkness into your glorious light, and for that, we are forever grateful. We know we are not worthy of such love and kindness, yet you have chose to bless us abundantly. Help us live our lives to reflect your grace, sharing our love, compassion, and forgiveness with others as you've shown to us. Father, fill us with your spirit so we may grow in wisdom and knowledge and so our faith may be strengthened. Guide us, Lord, that we may walk in your will and your way to fulfill your purpose that you have for each of us. Lift up anyone who's struggling, Father. We ask that your grace be upon them. Let your grace be a beacon of hope and encouragement in our lives. Thank you, Father, for your never-ending grace. May we live our lives to be a testament to you, and may we always give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.